And uh, we're also co-sponsored by the city of Tumwater and the and TCTV. Robert over there is uh, videotaping this that will well, not tape anymore, video recording. And that'll be on the uh, TCTV channel 26, Tumwater channel. And that'll be at about a month from now that'll be in the rotation so you'll get to see the program again. So let's uh, see, what else do we have here? I guess just say welcome to Historic Schmidt House. <laughs> and um, in fact, our guest today, uh, it's prehistory that we're dealing with this time to start off our season, which is a little di different for me. I'm usually used to going to old newspaper articles or the, or the archives or the state library for, for research. But this is prehistory. This is even pre-tribal. I mean, they're, they're oral traditions. We, we go older than that now. Of course, this is the first peoples here in North America that we're going to be talking about during the Ice Age, when there was a huge sheet of ice over Puget Sound. I think I'm as far south as Tonino, perhaps. And so... Uh, Earlier this year, we had hosted a meeting here in this room, and, and Dale Crows was uh, part of that meeting, and he started talking about some of the archaeological digs that he's been involved with here locally, and he talked about mastodons here, and there was evidence of spears that would, uh, they could hunt mastodon in this, in this very county. So that's, that's where we got the, the uh, title for the talk, uh, Hunting Elephants in Thurston County, and so that really did happen. And so he's going to be talking about the evidence and the local digs and some of the... the the uh, current theories about the first peoples of North America, so I, I won't spoil your... Uh, in fact, I'll let you introduce yourself. You can talk. He's a retired archaeologist uh, with South... I think it's South Beach Zone Community College, right? 20 years. 20 years with him. Okay, good. Well, it, when you're in archaeology, your career lies in ruins. But it, I, <laughs> That's the disc jockey in me. Okay. But I'm going to let him introduce himself. And his associates also contributed to the presentation today, so I'll let you talk about them too. But let's have a warm and uh, dry welcome for Dr. Dale Crows. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, I really appreciate that. And yeah, we're, we'll uh, be actually looking at what <clears throat> um, might be uh, the first entry of humans period in, into this second earth, which very likely came down the coast. And we're, we're uh, certainly saying that probably the first place they would have come into this whole second earth of the Americas is the Shalish River after they came down the uh, ice front. <coughs> um, and yes, indeed, there were lots of uh, uh, things here that they might be interested in hunting. They were mostly marine people at that time. Uh, but they certainly were hunting, you know, uh, sea lions and other big things. Uh, this is a picture of what might be going on here if you were here 12,000 years ago. I'm sure our fearless leader, Don, would be <laughs> up front <coughs> poking an elephant right in the front. And he'd just stand there, right? Uh, and, and we have Shanna Stevenson, our... Our main uh, historian for Olympia is, is, is here, and I spelled her name right. Now, David, I don't know where David is. He's, he's the uh, chair of the Thurston County Historic Commission and maybe the Olympia Historic Commission. Who knows David Shipley? But <laughs> Two people. <laughs> the same people. Well, good, but tell them I did this. So um, I doubt they were doing this. I doubt Don would go up to a wild... Uh, <clears throat> mammoth and poke it with a spear. Um, but there are people that believe that that's part of the way they take them down. Um, <clears throat> you have to remember uh, when people first came here, they were the first people. The first people. And they're still here. But these animals have never seen anything like this. This horrendous predator. Um, they had never seen them. They didn't evolve with them. You know, uh, buffalo who came over with uh, over the land bridge, and, and in fact, camels did, and a number of other animals, um, they would have known humans. They evolved with humans in the old world. So, buffalo were pretty hard to get unless you had a horse. And then, once, once tribes had horses, they had the technology to, to, to go after buffalo. But these animals would have never seen a human ever. Would have, you know, we have lots of movies about people, things that might want to eat us, uh, aliens that would come into the world and, and we couldn't kill them and they'd be nasty, very nasty. And that's exactly what these animals would have been faced, something that was evolved into the premier predator 
uh, and using weaponry that um, could easily uh, cause them uh, a lot of harm. Uh, they had a lot of other things going on, like the glaciers melting. In fact, where you're sitting here, <coughs> people might be coming over you, but maybe 50 feet in Lake Russell. This would be uh, freshwater Lake Russell because the ice hadn't melted far enough north to break into um, Strait of Juan de Fuca. So that's part of what this area would have been, uh, you know, inviting would it be a big pluvial lake. And uh, the first people that came into the continent, and there's a, you know, we're, we're trying to say how they did, uh, who were they, you know, uh, where did they come from? These are all still uh, debatable kinds of questions. We're pretty sure they were in Washington 13,800 years ago because of a, of a site we'll show you called Manus Mastodon where they found a spear point in the vertebra of a mastodon up by Squim. Uh, anybody heard of Manus Mastodon? And it, yeah, it, they used to have tours there. It's an amazing site. Lots of elephant remains there. And you certainly see elephant remains in this area because um, they were here for probably a million or so years. And the <coughs> Manus site is 13,800 years ago. So they would have been certainly here before the time we're talking about. And uh, up a big inlet, they would have been still ice on the east end of it if they knew, and there's not a lot, a lot of incentive, they could probably breach that ice front, and, and they did go up on them, but they might have found Lake Russell, which we would be under here. Uh, but if, if you know of Great Salt Lake, well, it's what's left of a basin lake called uh, Bonneville, <coughs> Bonneville Salt Flats. They like those kinds of places, Lake Lahontan in, in Oregon, uh, even older signs of humans in Paisley Cave, Fort Rock Cave. Uh, they like these, these lakes, and we're not high enough here to be on an island, but some of the Black Hill edges uh, of South Peter Sound Community College would be island. That should say I, I, I did teach there. I am an adjunct professor at Washington State University. Uh, they, they keep renewing me until at least 2019. Don't hold that against me, but we're doing pretty good. We're doing pretty good, aren't we? And so, is, so are the Huskies. Um, and, uh, and I've worked with uh, these individuals, Vic Becerra, has taken this idea and published it, and we're about to, to publish it again, we hope, uh, in a book called Af Alpha. Do you know the rest of the title? I should have brought the book, but it's on Onalaska. It's about, you know, the Shalis area. And uh, anybody read that? I should have brought it. But it has this hypothesis in it, nicely presented with great, pic great maps. We'll show you some of the maps. Now, Vic is really into media, and he can't be here. He's in Arizona, but he's doing a rough video of what I'm talking about. And that'll bring it to life. And we'll show you this rough, and you'll see some places where he wants to replace pictures and things. But it, he very nicely shows you how this works, this whole idea of people moving down our coast and into our area up the <coughs> Shealus River. Um, and uh, Scott Williams is a uh, Department of <coughs> Transportation archaeologist and quite a lithic specialist. Something I'm really not, but, uh, but he, he's the one that's really looked into the elephant hunter weaponry that has been found in our area, and in particular in uh, <coughs> Puget Sound and into Elma and some other places. These are the Clovis people, and this would be depicting people that are Clovis people, but I don't think they're, they're poking an elephant. Anybody seen a wild elephant in Africa? Would you go up to it with anything less <laughs> than a 357 Magnum or something? And uh, I've seen them, and boy, we stuck with the guide who had the rifle. And the elephants didn't like that. They stayed away, even though it was a single action bolt action. <laughs> Boy, uh, they're they're pretty uh, pretty scary. Even if they didn't know what you were, I mean, the point that they wouldn't have known what you were means you might be able to, for some time, walk right up to one, and he still wouldn't know what to do with you, um, or other things like gigantic bison that you'll hear about, and uh, even sloths. And but there's a lot of predators too. There's things you don't want to mess with, like saber-toothed cats and short-faced bears. 
that did evolve the capability of hunting these animals like we, you know, a different way, of course, than we can. Um, <clears throat> the weaponry, I think, we would see are what called spear throwers or atolls, and they're uh, huge ballistics. They do have a 357 magnum kind of ballistics, and it extends your arm twice as long, so you have all that leverage without having to evolve a longer arm. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, certainly have the ability to to pierce an elephant, and you don't have to be up on top of it like Don was. You can be <laughs> way, you know, 150 feet back and probably nail this animal pretty well. Here's the, here's a spear thrower here, see again, and I brought a target, and it's kind of wet, but I know there's an area in the back where we could try this if you want. I only have one aluminum dart, so, but you could see the ballistics. This thing is o ominous. I mean, it's really pretty good, and it's a nice elephant. <laughs> uh, I just did that just now, and uh, you put your finger thumbs through here, and it makes your arm have that much more leverage. And uh, you can throw things 10 times as, or excuse me, four, three times as far with 10 times the impact, 10 times the ballistic impact. So they have tried these on elephants. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, here's one. They're dead elephants. <clears throat> but just to see how well you could go into the animal, how well these, uh, these kinds of Clovis points that we do find in Puget Sound, we find over in East Wenatchee, the largest ever made uh, up at your state capitol museum. You may have seen them on display. <clears throat> um, and they do find them uh, amongst elephant bones, the, these kinds of darts. And uh, what you do, this is the one we would use outside, and it'll go right through, through that wall in the back where you wanted, I could show you, or you can go to the exit windows if you wanted to, but they keep this place so nice. You keep it. And, uh, you're basically throwing it like a baseball, finger thumb, holding it into the, the hook. The big trick is to push it from this hook, this bone hook. And uh, it, it really is an, an amazing weapon. We certainly see these 20, 30,000 years ago in cave paintings in Europe this very same kind of weaponry. Uh, and uh, I don't think I have pictures of it, but you, you certainly see it. Um, the, the business end is these Clovis darts, which have a flute up the edge that we do find in Olympia and, and uh, up in um, Bashan Island, up down at Elma, across in Chehalis. This is a, a cat you can take a look at, but it's known for its thinning in the base where they're really taking nice long flakes off. But these are great knives, too. The ones, if you've seen them at, at East Wenatchee, people say those are too damn big to be, you know, projecto points. They probably are knives. Or they're showing off. I mean, there's a lot of art in this that people were showing how good they were. So we'll pass that around. The, uh, they had a foreshaft, sometimes out of elephant bone. The East Wenatchee has a whole series of mammoth uh, uh, bones that are carved and decorated. So this would be your bullet, really. So you'd stick that in. You'd have a lot of these. You might have just three of these, three or four. You'd stick that into the foreshaft. And uh, Dan Miot, who's state parks archaeologist, their talk next time is uh, with state parks. He's a lithic specialist, so he makes these. And he was going to try to be here, but he couldn't today. Um, so you put that in, in there, and then you, here's his, here's the spear thrower. And we find uh, the, the hooks, you find the, certainly the, you know, the projectile points that would probably have been hafted into these. They're usually a little bigger than an arrow point, and and then you you take aim at this elephant here, and 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 you push it with the uh, thrower, and, it, and it's just like a baseball. And this should go hopefully hit its target and go well in. The animal well, he's gonna not like it, but he's gonna shake this off. So as he might hopefully go the other way, but he probably won't. 
you recover your dart and you pull out one other bullet and you reload and keep letting them have it. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to ask questions, but I can't hear us. What was this thing made out of bamboo? Oh, these are made out of willow, usually a willow shaft. I'm not sure what Dan's is here. The willows are really good. Bamboo's kind of, it'd be a heck of a good material, but not as easy to come by back then. Wood rocks, so how do you know what it was made out of? Oh, uh, we do have waterlogged sites. That's my specialty, where you do find wood and fiber preserved. And some, most of these four shafts at East Wenatchee were elephant bone, so that, that helps to they had, reconstruct it. Yeah. They had um, arrow straighteners with circles yeah. in the, the They had those wrenches <laughs> at this time, and we yeah. find those, yeah, in, in these Clovis sites, <laughs> yeah, which are a big bone thing with a hole in it, so you could go down the willow shaft and, and straighten it, or any, any kind of a shaft. It's more of a straightener to get this if it's bent, you can get it to straighten. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so it's pretty sophisticated. It really is like having a 357 Magnum. These people were quite capable of, of the kind of ballistics we're used to in in, in their hunting. And uh, um, you know, great other great game, you know big game hunters, of course, are Macaws and other and all. So would go after whales and very successfully. I mean, if you read a new book called uh, The Sea is My Country, they were more successful, those whalers were more successful than the non-Indian whalers <laughs> in bringing in the amount of oil because they're pulling these whales into ships. Have you seen that? I don't know if you've seen that book, but yeah, this, this is Justin James who we work with from Quinault, so he, he's fact-checking me. So, <laughs> but if anybody is really related he, he would be related through time to these, these very early people. Because uh, we're saying they came here first. You know, not down an interior corridor or, <coughs> or from the, across the Atlantic, which are suggestions both. Um, so let me just point out these, doesn't work now, but these uh, blue lines are all the Clovis points that have been found in our area. So they were definitely here. And they're definitely in a, throughout North America associated with elephant hunting or mammoths and mastodons. So anyway, they, they certainly were here. You don't see them. Uh, yeah. You see an earlier people, and I think in, in Justine's area, with what's called stem points. Um, that might be these first people before Clovis. <clears throat> we just, I just want to show you that we do have them here, like we see throughout North America. And they're definitely, they're probably <clears throat> very interested in, after the ice breaks, uh, and this becomes the Inland Sea, Saltwater Sea, 13,000 years ago. That's about when Clovis people were really doing, their, doing the most activity throughout North America. Well, they would have found uh, a drawdown of this Lake Russell this, that we're under here, <coughs> opening up huge stretches of open... Uh, areas that they would find, the elephants would find interesting, and, and all of the animals <coughs> trying to, you know, utilize this area, which would be a pretty good step grassland. Um, some evidence we have of, uh, so maybe some earlier style points that would be where this lake spilled, which is uh, Black Lake Spillway. Black River. Anybody been on the Black River? It barely you know, it goes both ways almost. It's so, uh, but at one time it carried all the uh, all the discharge from Lake Russell, which would have carried all the discharge from the Olympics and the uh, Cascades. So you had a Columbia River-sized river easily going down through Chehalis. You know, if you you look at the Chehalis River today, you say, well, how come you have such a huge valley here? You know, if you, I don't know if you ever think of it that way, but <clears throat> that river never could have created the valley that's the Chehalis River Valley today. It took this huge uh, river. And oop, this, this is a point we did find that's unusual in style that's along that Black Lake spillway. It, it definitely has, it's not exactly a stemmed point, but it has little notches. And it's, this is your, 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 uh, um, <clears throat> Clovis Point from Vashon Island area, 
Uh, or no, man, it must be Bainbridge Island, but that is the one that was recovered uh, <clears throat> in a person's farm in their peat, farm, peat bog. Um, and uh, the archaeologist went to that family and said, do you have any old arrowheads you might have followed, found at some point, and, like we always do? And, and, uh, <clears throat> and the woman says, oh, yeah, I think so. So she went through her drawer with all the knickknacks and all the... <laughs> the, uh, you know, potato smashers and all the other things, you know, she had and pulled this out. I said, oh yeah, I found this. And that crossed a lot of interest because it's another yeah. find of a, of a Clovis plane. They did test it and didn't find anything else. But an individual brought this forward from the Black Lake Spillway area up on the terrace. And it's monstrous in size. Look at the size of that. And that's Scott Williams who, uh, has, has done the most work on this, and we did find the tip of it when the UW tested. Um, the University of Washington tested it, and uh, they didn't find it in their screens. The owner found it after they left in their backfill, you know, where they, they missed it. But he found it, and sure enough, um, it was the tip. So they were in the right spot. <laughs> um, and so we were looking at all these ways that people might have come in through this area, including uh, what you probably grew up remembering from all the, the stories of uh, uh, interior corridor between ice fronts. Well, this would have been not a very nice area, and before it really opened up, you'd have had these long, sterile lakes you'd have to cross, and they're just, it really wasn't very good to after about 13,000. So we're saying they're going from refugium to refugium down this coast, and when they get into our area, the first good place to come in would be the Shealish River. It'd be the first time <coughs> in generations that you would have looked to the east and not seen ice. I mean, it had to have been unbelievable to these people. They, they'd never seen a, uh, a vista without ice to the east. I mean, horrendous ice that you would never even want to get into very much. But once they got to the Shealish River, one, it's a huge river, but two, <laughs> where's the ice? You know, you have this whole second earth that nobody's ever been to. Um, some people say they might have come this way from Europe because of the style of the Clovis points, but that's just true speculation. And it's a horrendous journey along just huge ice fronts with no refugium, no land at all. Um, and... Uh, the genetics, really, the DNA that's come out really says that, no, these uh, folks that came in here were very much um, from the Asian area or in parts of that Asian area, but they, they were such a small group, they're really their own genetic uh, makeup because it's a, a, a hundred people, maybe, and that's all the genes you'd have to really work with in terms of future generations, and so you would look very different. <clears throat> but the genetics does say it's more affiliated, not with a Europe, but with <coughs> Asia. Um, so you had to deal with this ice. This is the 13,000, 12,000, KYA, thousand years ago. And uh, <coughs> the coast uh, had this this area that, that basically uh, um, was covered into a did melt away and, and very late. But if you went down the interior, you would, for one, have to go across horrendous <coughs> uh, bogs, really, lakes that were sterile and probably wall-to-wall -wall ice, and, and glaciers. So it's not a very good route to take until much later. Uh, and uh, Kennewick Man, you may have heard of, uh, he... Uh, you know, even back then they're showing interior corridor, but these red dots are mine. I'm saying there's probably a continental shelf people forever that became uh, people who uh, occupied the, the second earth as well as eventually the South Pacific and, uh, and, and were Ainu for one. Um, and that's what they're saying, this 9,300-year-old person. Anyway, we have a lot of neat sites in our area, that's for sure. Um, we're more like, you know, the, anyway, the features and reconstructed here, if you compare it to everybody around the world, more like uh, those from the ancient Japanese Ainu, who were indigenous people. Uh, so they, 
they, they shouldn't have the continental shelf look. <clears throat> so let's show you the lake we're under. Yeah. Uh, didn't Kennewick Man on the testing of the uh, uh, remains indicate that uh, he had lived a lot of his life on a marine diet? Uh, on a marine that. diet, yeah, he had quite a bit of isotopes that show he was he had a marine diet. So he might have been over in might have been over in areas. Uh, uh, he was obviously an, an amazing individual. The main um, main actual archaeology they have with him is a big stone biface stuck into his pelvis that probably happened when he was twelve and he survived that. And he. Uh, so he, he was an adventurous sort, and he he did pretty well. Uh, um, and yeah, they're they're still working on on that. But he was unfortunately not um, turned over properly at the time, according to certain laws, to work in, in equal partnership with tribes. So that's caused nothing but problems. Um, but even the tribes, like the Umatilla, had a PhD in physical anthropology on employment, you know, in their employment. They're not against science by any means. <clears throat> anyway, going back to Manus, we found this spear in the, the rib over here, and for the longest time that would have been an inlet. They, at this point, could have gotten into this lake, glacial Lake Russell, but we're saying this was pretty iced in, and they moved down, and here's your spillway uh, through uh, Black Lake. <clears throat> Uh, certainly a, an amazing uh, <clears throat> recent research that shows the age and fact that it is a humanly made spear, spear point. <clears throat> but that's 13,800 years ago. <clears throat> and so we're saying it's really more like an inlet like this. They, they certainly would have glaciers on the Olympics, but this is how much uh, a coast you'd have exposed for moving down, which is now all drowned, so you're not going to see a lot. But once they do come in here, then these terraces and uh, Willapa Bay, there's a new dissertation where they're finding lots of old style um, stem points. And I haven't got that yet. Have you seen, heard about that? It's out of WSU. Which makes sense, because people would like these entrance way into these polluvial lakes. That's what they're seeing. <clears throat> In Oregon, too, the stem points around where this lake eventually drains. Uh, so some of this lake would have been pretty much in the Chehalis Valley when <clears throat> when the ice was as thick as it is. Of course, then now, yeah, down right, we'd be under a lot of ice right now as well. But more of the time period of people, if they were here, they'd be paddling over us and skin boats probably 50 feet above us. <clears throat> Any questions? I'm not sure. We're actually doing pretty good for time. Um, Another five or ten minutes. Yeah, five or ten minutes. And then if you did want to go out and try to add a little, that would be fun. It's nice <laughs> weather now. Yeah. yeah. The um, archaeological dig and squim, uh, did they ever publish the results? Or is there a display somewhere of their findings? It's certainly displayed in squim. They're very proud of it in there. I think they're getting a new museum for Squim, and I'm sure it'll be featured in it. Um, but uh, <clears throat> it's published, uh, this latest work is published. Unfortunately, sometimes this doesn't get well published, and it, it never did, and we lost Carl Gustafson, the director of the project, not too long ago from WSU. Uh, but others are coming in, like Texas A&M, and re-looking at the evidence and proving them right, which is really good to see that he, he was proved right on it. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, I think we are in a very exciting location in, the, in terms of this. Um, and, you know, the languages here, they can't connect them with any of the other languages uh, uh, in North America. The Coast Salish, the Wakashans, the Chimakuans, uh probably been here. You know, they're definitely probably the first people to come into the continent and settle into this area, mm -hmm. uh, Salish Sea and the coast. And uh, so we're in an area that has deep, deep, deep roots for human uh, <coughs> heritage. Yeah. One question I've always had about it, why is it that some of the earliest uh, finds in the Indians have been down in Chile and 
Yeah, that's a good question. Because they were um, the, the models that they run, they figure if they can get here, and these are people that I would suggest are continental shelf, coastal people. Well, it makes sense they would have moved right along the coast and stayed probably associated with something that they're most familiar with all the way down into South America. But it, they say it's, and then, you know, the, the Panama Canal area, you just have to hop over, then you can move your way up the east coast of the Americas and become Clovis hunters, which it seems to be the oldest dates are in the southeast for these Clovis peoples. Um, but um, the, the, uh, <clears throat> so it, the models show maybe you could, you could move, these population movement models, you could move throughout North America within 1,000 years to get through South America another 1,000 years. So 2,000 years once you make the continent. There's nobody here, uh, there's no humans here to interfere with anything as far as movement. Uh, and that's unusual for people to have that kind. And that's why, you know, Coast Sage people say they have been here forever. Well, essentially, if you take 100 people, nobody's interfering with them. They, their cultural roots are here. They started here, and they've been here culturally for forever. So they did start here in that perception, you know, that cultural perception of who they are. And, uh, yeah. Second question. Did the glaciers come and go? I mean, did they grow and then... Yes. Yeah, there was several fluctuations, but it's really that last one that potentially could be involving humans. Uh, we certainly know that our kind uh, shows up, but not very symbolically capable, you know, 150,000 years ago in Africa. Um, and then... <coughs> uh, it takes them a while to really start really moving into Asia and, and Europe. So you're really not seeing people in Asia areas or even, you know, anatomically modern humans rather than Neanderthal. You're not seeing them in, in Europe to about that last glacial period. <clears throat> so, so uh, you know, unless you're thinking somebody that was not anatomically modern, you know, but... Neanderthal couldn't go that far north. It, you know, when you got symbolic, you got involved with things like fitted clothing, and and Neanderthal certainly used fire, uh, but they didn't seem as capable of this kind of movement. You know, basically Neanderthals don't go above fifty-three degrees north latitude. We certainly did. You know, just places you know like Eskimos thrive in. So yeah, Dale. Um, Okay, one more question. Maybe two. <laughs> he raises that a little faster. Thank you. Uh, isn't it closer, if you're looking for these tools and, and trying to find tool remains, isn't it closer to looking to finding the tip of the needle in a stack of, of haystacks? The reason I say that is time and time again we've discovered that even if we have, if we have good tools to make these Neolithic tools, it takes an enormous amount of skill. And one of these items would be it would have been one of the prized possessions of these people traveling along. So they were, unless it broke or was lost in, in some kind of calamity, you wouldn't find these tools. You would find butchery remains and sites like that. That's, that's probably why. Yeah. And considering that most of the area here has been underwater, we may never find a, a remnant, wouldn't we? I mean, it's, it's the odds are just against us for finding right. these tools. Yeah, well, it's very, I mean, it's like taking a, this room full. And heading out, you know, we, we'll, we'll, how much would you see? You, you know, these are very mobile, more or less mobile people. Um, but the lithics would have been very valued because you, you probably couldn't just go in and get it. And that's why I say if there's ever any, um, you know, small river outflow along those glaciers, they probably went up there to get the cobbles and look for lithics. 
and they'd be curating it very carefully. So, <clears throat> and, and that's the truth with these elephant sites that you do find, you know, the fact that we find the Clovis points because they probably lost it, you know, or, right. and, uh, or some kid lost it, you know. <laughs> Children add a lot to archaeology, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> a point they could not recover. It looks like they were reusing the points over and over again, but they were yeah. point we did find that was found. Looks like a point you could not be able not be able to recover because it's so deeply embedded. Yeah, yeah, you're going to try to keep keep that stuff curated and, and with you, and uh, there, you know things do happen like accidents, and you do see that in some of the Neanderthal sites where they find a whole family, but it looks like they were they were murdered, uh, um, you know, by others, <laughs> probably other Neanderthals. But you find the remains of the whole family, and they are abandoned, and they find other things there. But um, those things certainly certainly happen too. Um, so it is needle in the haystack. But we have one of the hardest sciences I think that exists because we're dealing with so little, and uh, trying to uh, figure out how people came here. You know, I think the Shadows River hypothesis just needs. A little more looking, and I, I didn't come up with it. I was told this by an archaeologist named Alan Bryan. He said, "Look at the Chehalis. That, that's really where you come in." One, I don't know. Yeah. If you, yeah. we've been, you, we're way over time here because <laughs> we got an early start. But uh, we, we're going to have you go out and uh, lead people through the box elephant hunting, or box mastodons, or whatever. And I stuff just to show you the ballistics, and I'm not the best at this, uh, but. Um, but I'm good enough, I think. We, you know, and we'll have let you let you try it too. But we only have one dart, I'm afraid. So we have to do a lot of recovery. And but we'll go where we're going is out here. There's a good place here where I can't hit your cars or any buildings. Just off of this corner of the building. All right. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, we packed out the house. We'll see if we can do it again next month. Thank you so much.